uh, creating a fair, non-biased, and compliant framework for review. This, at its core, again, is why we built Reviewer. So again, we built Reviewer as a volunteer review committee member, and we got quite frankly fed up with uh, A, how uh, overwhelming it was for us, and B, how unfair some of the selections were and the programs that we were running. If your program doesn't do that stuff, kudos to you. I'm proud of you. Um, but it's unfortunate and sad that it's uh, it is a problem across the space in general. So if the goal is to create a fair, non-biased, compliant review and selection process, what do you need to do to get to that point? And I think that there's two kind of key core components. Number one is how we pair up applicants with individuals to review them. And then number two is what data the review team can physically see. So uh, again, at a high level, just to summarize, um, number one is that we want to ideally uh, uh, randomize the applicants for our review teams. There's a lot of ways that we can get to this point. I know many of you have dedicated review committees on a per scholarship basis or an award basis. You might be doing multi-phase review where phase one is vetting processes, phase two is judging, phase three is interviews. That really doesn't matter. You can still incorporate some of these components to each one of them, but I wanna basically take your applicants and I wanna randomly distribute it back out to your review team with kind of two things in mind. Number one is like, what is the number of uh, uh, reviews that each applicant should get to make sure that you you know have a, enough variety to make fair decisions? Um, number two is I also wanna look into like, what is the workload capacity of your committee members? And if you don't know that, we have to be surveying them, right? We have to know on average, like how long does it take you to fill out a score sheet and evaluate an applicant? Um, how many do you feel comfortable doing? Um, I can't even believe I'm about to say this. We have a client that before working with us had 900 essays uh, for a scholarship program, and they had a team review each of those 900. I don't even know how you can physically decipher the, I don't know how you can read that many, but how do you compare number four to number 897, right? And so we have to figure what that out looks like. Um, number two is once we have this done, we need to redact PII, um, so personal identifying information. If you think it might be PII, it probably is, err on the side of caution. So uh, anything that would uh, help the evaluator know who the candidate is, demographic details, all that stuff should be hidden. Um, I also want to note that also if, it, if you're collecting a bunch of content in your submission form for record keeping purposes that isn't relevant to review and selection, redact that as well, right? The idea is to lower the barrier for your volunteers as well. So if they don't need to see it, just don't show it to them. Um, I do want to kind of point out a very, very important thing that I'm going to come back to in a second is that if you are going to randomly distribute submissions to your committees, that typically implies that not every applicant is reviewed by the same people. That presents a, a tremendous challenge in the sense that you might have some evaluators that are stricter than others. And if that is the case, we have to be able to identify that. So I'm going to come back to that here as another trend here in just a few minutes. Before I show you how to do this in Reviewer, I also want to talk about the next piece of this, and that's um, broadening the evaluation criteria. Three years ago, most of these programs, uh, awards, grants, and scholarships would give their evaluation committees a scorecard, and they would say, assign a point value on a scale of one to 10 for this, one to five for this. They might even weight the scoring, and that's fine. The problem, though, is that judges very easily get bogged down in numbers, right? So like, what's the difference between a seven and an eight? And as that point scale grows, like, what's the difference between a 16 and an 18? And so there's some things that we want to kind of look into. Um, it also depends on the type of program that you're offering. Um, but how do we start to look at like what your scorecards visually look like? And I think it needs to be more of a direct reflection on the mission and vision of your organization. You're launching this program for a reason. You're asking your candidates to submit content and deliverables for a specific purpose. It's okay to weight them and put a, a stronger emphasis on certain components that are more relevant to why you're selecting these people. Um, a really good example is in a scholarship program, you're likely collecting three key pieces of data, um, academic information, ideally community information as well. So things like volunteer opportunities, uh, clubs that they're in. And then number three is that you're collecting personal stories and essays. Um, I don't know. I, I graduated high school in 2008. I know I'm not old, but I also not young. Um, I thought school was kind of hard. I hear people nowadays getting like 4.3 GPAs left and right. So if that's the case, then grades are kind of out the window because everybody's getting good grades. And so how do we start to differentiate one candidate from the next? And that's where we can kind of really get into things like essay writing and, and impact statements and let's weight them higher. 
Um, with that said, you know, a lot of you may have specific eligibility criteria for your programs. It could be GPA or if it's another type of campaign, like a grant or a scholarship or an award program. Um, instead of having you have people score them, let's just automatically do it, right? So if you get a 3.5 GPA, we can automatically associate a certain number of points versus like a 2.5. I don't want your review committees having to read through applications and do their own math, right? So let's leverage that for you. So the reason why I jumped straight to this is that I'm gonna show you this alongside the redaction of information uh, all at the same time. So with that said, in reviewer, again, this is uh, why we built the company, right? Reviewer is named reviewer because of the review perspective. Um, we have the ability to create what I call review workflows. And uh, it's super powerful, yet also very simple at the same time. And the general goal here is I like to visualize, visualize it as a bucketing system. So you need to take your applicants and put them into a bucket. You then need to take a team of reviewers and put them into a bucket as well. And in theory, the applicants in that bucket get reviewed by the evaluators in that bucket. Now, it's not that easy. Um, you know, you can create uh, buckets in a wide variety of uh, processes. It could be uh, the, uh, based off of award categories. It could be based off of the scholarships or grants that you're offering. If it's an abstract, it could be the topic or the speaker. Um, it could be a combination of that and phases of review, right? So submissions come in and they're reviewed by a certain team of people uh, for vetting thumbs up, thumbs down, and then moves on to a score sheet review. And then it gets uh, added to a finalist selection. So now I didn't get too deep into the weeds of how to do that today. Just note that it's also not just a way to categorize applicants, but also progression based. Um, but to use this example, I've got a bucket called the Lennox Wilder Grant. And let's make up some kind of crazy numbers. Let's pretend that we have, you know, uh, 350 applicants who applied to the Lennox Wilder Grant. And I've got a whopping over here off to the right, six people who are in charge of reviewing them. Like I physically can't have them review all 600 submissions. So what's really cool about this is automation, number one, is that as an applicant comes in, it'll automatically drop them into whatever bucket that they correspond to, if we know that. Number two is that you can then fill up your bucket with a review committee. Once I open my buckets up, it actually shows me some pretty cool things. So it'll show me a listing of all of my applicants. I know this is a high level example. There's only six applicants in this bucket. But it shows me both all of my applicants as well as who the potential evaluators are. I stress on that because just because you're an evaluator in that bucket does not imply you're gonna be reviewing everybody. So what you can do is you could say, well, for the sake of fairness and compliance, I just want my applicants to get reviewed exactly three times, no less, no more. Or on the flip side or in conjunction with, maybe you wanna say, I want my review team to review no more than 15 people because they just don't have the uh, bandwidth to do more than 15, but they have to do at a bare minimum eight. So you can actually bulk select your applicants in the system, and then you can auto assign them out. So I can say in this example, give every applicant to no more than six evaluators, but no less than four. And then boom, the system will take your submissions and equally and randomly distribute it out to your team for review. Now, with that said, you need to have overwrite ability. So I like to see in our scorecard systems or in the selection tool, a recusal process, right? Ideally that we can get ahead of that early on in the pairing. Um, but we want to make sure that we can make the evaluator recuse themselves for whatever reason. It's also important, too, because um, it's very common for evaluators maybe to drop out or not finish up their work. And so we need to take whatever leftover applicants that weren't scored and redistribute them back out to other people. So there's automation that we can do on that front. But also, if I click on, say, for example, Mark, Mark is one of my evaluators. He's currently evaluating Gabrielle, Leslie, Richard, and Sheldon. I could actually uncheck somebody's name and then reassign it to Gilligan if I need to. So at its core, we're taking a bunch of applicants, evaluators, and pairing them up through randomization and automation. The next step is to, um, as Mark, the evaluator, come in and actually conduct a review. And that's, again, we're going to focus on two things. One, redacting of information. And then number two is uh, having Mark fill out a very well put together score sheet that is more um, question based prompts than numerical values. So what does that look like? When Mark comes into the platform, he gets his own menu system as well. And that's going to be a listing of all of the applicants or candidates that he's supposed to be scoring. Um, again, reviewers not blurry. Uh, I'm just trying to indicate that if you want to redact or hide PII or names, you can definitely do so. But the general idea is that Mark, the reviewer, can then click on the ID of the applicant and he gets a split screen. So half of the page here is the profile or the components of the profile you want to be evaluated. So everything from phone numbers to emails to demographic details, all of this is being redacted. 
The goal, though, is to lower the barrier for your review team so they can actually side by side, scroll through the submission form, they can fill out their score sheet, they can jump up to the attachments at the top. You can see that I have a bunch of deliverables that have been uploaded. I can press view. You'll notice that those uploads actually embed themselves right in reviewer. So it could be PowerPoints, PDFs, spreadsheets, photos, videos, you name it. Um, we talked earlier on about references, or if it's an award program, maybe you want the evaluator to also see the nomination that was filled out on behalf of the nominee. I can jump up to my supplemental forms. I can see a listing of all those additional uh, deliverables. I can click view. Uh, and again, here's Ann Perkins. She submitted this reference letter uh, or reference template, uh, I should say. And then off to the right is my scorecard. Now you will see that this scorecard is not going to be uh, assign 10 points for this or six points for this. Instead, we have really well thought out questions that align with the mission and vision of the organization that actually pair up one-to-one -one with the submission form. Now what's gonna happen is the uh, uh, review team, much like your references I mentioned beforehand, um, they're answering a series of questions, it's a very similar concept. So from good to great or from uh, good uh, to exemplatory, right? The evaluator is answering a series of questions um, I do show you that there's a point value here. You can actually hide that if you want to. So the review team just answers questions. But the goal is that there's no spreadsheets and there's no math involved. Uh, what ends up happening, sorry, there's no math from your point of view involved. As soon as this evaluator is done scoring, they press submit. And then you as an operations team get this full-blown leaderboard. And it shows you on a per program basis or per uh, phase basis, all of your applicants, the individuals that review them, we give you total scores, we give you averages, and then you can use this to make data, uh, data driven decisions off of the results. Now to jump ahead even further, you will see here um, a, a really good example. I got Mark here that gave this a score of a 12 and Judge Judy gave it a 31. Like that's a pretty massive difference between scores. So then the question comes into play, um, did Judge Judy just score this really, really well? Or did Mark, the judge that gave it a 12, just really hate it? Or what if Mark just never gives higher than a 15 and a 12 was actually really, really good? If that's the case, we got a big, big problem because now we have an applicant being penalized because we have an evaluator who, traditionally speaking, is a bit more strict than others. So um, that kind of brings us into one of the last things that we're going to look at today, which is the normalization of results.